Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of TED Excellence, the series in which you can watch live the slow and incremental descent into madness by yours truly. And I come to you live from my Corona Bunker on the moon with Dog Cat Fox, A Pepper Jack, and all of you. Hello, chat. Hello, everyone. Ah, oh, welcome to Wednesday. Wondrous Wednesday or something. Oh, have we got a treat in store for you guys today? I can already tell just by the title. We'll get to that in a second. Because who, or might I say, Hugh is here with us today. Why that would be Jaeger Pony. Hello, Zach Osborne. Hello, Functional. Hello, Check Your Logic. Hello, Mr. Scott JD7. Hello, Brutus. Hello, Et Tu Brute. John Miller. Hello, Midday Sin. Hello, Dark Alisle. Hello, Keeverdam. Hello, The Broken Baller. Hello, Sunnum Nation. Hello, The Gayest Person on YouTube. Thank you so much. One, please. One you shall have. Uh, that one served as a Tania. Hello, uh, Mr. Joestar. Hello, Keenan. Hello. The Pissed Off Shih Tzu, hello. Emerald, hello. Stupid Clown, hello. Emperor, WR, Costin, hello. Gear, PG, hello. This is Kyle, thank you so much. Hello, chat people and scribbles. Hello, Kyle. Raziel, hello. Angela Ariaga, hello. Crimson Tiger, hello. Lurking Gopher, hello. <gasps> Peer D Bear, hello. Tarkata, hello. Now I'm, ca I'm caught up to chat, so now it's coming in slowly but surely. Uh, Black Belt for Christ, hello. Oh, boy, guys. Uh, Deco Deco, hello. Zombie Teddy, hello. And uh, so where are we? Well, uh, it's going to be something else today, I'm pretty sure. Because the title alone of this sucker is, is one to behold, as engines roar behind me. Uh, so what is the title of today's TED Excellence? Well, it is, How Can I Have a Positive Racial Identity? I'm white! Ah, I don't know. I'm curious to find out. Now, uh, as I've, I know I've mentioned in past uh, broadcasts, either Lords of the Night or this one, the concept of racial identity uh, is something that is, it was alien to me when I was younger, and it's more so alien to me now. I'll explain that in a second. Thank you, Lady Gover, for the Dogcat Fox. Big smile, Dogcat Fox. Hello. Uh, oh, Brutus says, scribe light, tis me, Graf Spree, undergoing a different name, hard for people to mispronounce Brutus. Was I, was I mispronouncing Graf Spree? I mean, I could say Brutus, just to make you happy. <laughs> uh, well, hello, Brutus Spree, or something, I don't know. But anyway, racial identity. So the first time that I was ever, I guess, introduced to the concept of uh, identi racial identitarian politics and, and the like uh, was a book, a book from a long time ago, oh, youngsters. Um, this is a book, and I still have my copy somewhere around here. Uh, it's called The Gathering Storm. And it was written, at least co-written, I believe, by Morris Dees, who is uh, from the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, or was. I think he had a Me Too moment the last couple of years. Anyway, uh, back then, the Southern Poverty Law Center was uh, in charge of something they called the Klan Watch Project. And what they did, and I believe it's still around to some extent, but essentially, they tracked the movements and activities of white supremacist organizations uh, in America and elsewise, I think, but especially in America and specifically the Ku Klux Klan. Um, this book, The Gathering Storm, came out after the Oklahoma City bombing because the militia movement, the survivalist movement, um, things of that nature uh, were becoming more of a concern, let's say, and more prevalent, especially after Oklahoma City uh, and things like Ruby Ridge and so on. And in that book, uh, I, it was the first time as a kid, at least, that I'd ever heard of the concept of white identity. And white identity was what was at the core of, well, white supremacist organizations. Uh, identifying yourself first and foremost as white, uh, as part of the race that is under threat, as part of the supreme race, and so on. Um, a philosophy where what binds you together first and foremost and forever is your skin color above anything else. 
And reading that book and given the context of the times and the organizations that practice that belief, I came very quickly to the opinion, and I think it's a relatively wise opinion, that racial identitarianism is not a healthy way to live your life or to look at the world or to assess others. Now, maybe that's just me, but regardless, that's the lesson I took away from reading that book and learning about the philosophy. Because it really doesn't matter what color skin we're talking about, racial identitarianism is not a good idea, and not a good way to move through the world, in my opinion. So in the last handful of years, as racial identity has been brought up over and over and over again as some sort of virtuous way to form a community and so on and so forth, uh, I, can't, I cannot help but think back to that book uh, telling me why that was a bad idea, as if it really needed much explanation. But apparently it still does. And that's why we're doing this TEDx, because I want to learn how can I have a positive racial identity? I mean, I'm white. So that's where I'm coming from on this. Uh, let's see, a few more hellos before we move into this. Uh, let's see, Re Terrapin, hello. Uh, Mike Savage, Blarg. Spiro Girl, hello. Uh, Sar Jim, hello. Alyssa Halcom, hello. Fernanda, hello. Drew W, hello. Irate Prostate, hello. The Luke Skywalker, too, hello. All right, guys, get your... Oh, Aloysius Fudpucker, hello. All right, guys, get your bingo cards ready. Jim Beam, hello. Uh, links in the description for the bingo card. I'm curious to see what happens next. Shio Gorath, hello. Death Glock, hello. Boy, oh, boy, oh, boy. All right, got to stop sometime. I'm, I'm very accommodating, but I got to get the show going. All right, so per usual, I'll start off with a couple seconds for uh, sound check. Um, I don't know why the uh, the screen is being chopped off by my little graphic this time. Usually it kind of, you know, shrink wraps itself to fit within that space, but hopefully it won't obscure anything in the actual presentation, but too late to change it now. So here we go. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for having me here. It's, this is such an honor to be a part of this powerful, amazing event and community. Okay. Amazing, powerful event community. You guys hear all that? Uh, oh, Pepper Jack. Help me through this. Uh, sounds good, says Kiefer Dam. Good, says Aloysius Fudpucker. Drew W. gives me the thumbs up. Alyssa Halcom gives me the good. Two first names, check. Ali, oh, Ali, oh, okay. I didn't even notice the person's name. I, like I say, unless... Unless or until the speaker brings up their name or their position or their whatever, I don't even pay attention. So, and besides, except for like the uh, uh, the previous one, the Rachel Cargill, who I already know who she was before the the, uh, the talk. I kind of like not knowing anything about the speaker and just let them let them sell themselves and their ideas all all on their lonesome without any uh, preamble. Uh, thank you, John Miller. You know how nasty that title sounds if you replace white with any other demographic? This could be the precursor for things to come. Yeah, it, it really isn't a very difficult mental exercise to take the fundamental notion of an idea or a philosophy, switch out a couple of words, and see if it still makes sense, even rhetorically, at all. But, you know, we, we can't we can't apply that much effort to thinking, can we? All right, so let's find out about how to make a positive racial identity. I'm going to talk today about whiteness. And sometimes that's not usually the first thing I say to people when I meet them. Ah, uh, press X to doubt. I wanna talk about whiteness. It can be kind of an awkward beginning. Whiteness is something we often don't talk about in our society explicitly. Really? Well, maybe not in society, but in the in the bubble universe in which I exist, it is talked about over and over and over again. But hey, I haven't had my quotient, uh, quotient, quotient for today, so fill me up. And especially for white people, it can tend to be this concept that is unnamed or invisible. Yeah, invisible, unnamed, intangible, almost like it kind of doesn't exist except in the minds of people that want to demonize and vilify people on the basis of their skin color. 
oh, sorry, I'm, I must be getting ahead of myself. And so it can be awkward to talk about it, but I talk about whiteness. It's part of my work. I talk about it for two reasons. Uh, two reasons. One, because it's a profitable business these days. And two, you can seem more interesting being a white person talking about whiteness because you've seen the light and are a converted sinner. Does that sound about right? One is that for a long time, I would show up to conversations on race and racism, and I would listen intently, and I would nod sympathetically to the stories of people of color, and I felt like I actually don't have anything to offer here. Well, of course you don't, because you're white. And, I, and honestly, you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. If Robin DiAngelo's book, White Fragility, has taught us nothing else, and it hasn't, uh, it's that any reaction of a white person to the stories or uh, struggles of anyone who isn't white, if you uh, get uh, irritated at being accused of being a racist, if you try to move yourself away from the conversation because you don't like being called a racist, if you get angry or sad, if you do anything other than stand there and take it, you're a bad white person. Except that also responding with silence is a bad thing to do because that shows your white fragility. So there really is no proper answer to it. So I've been told by white people educating me on the failings of white people. Uh, thank you, Point Curation. A grifter talking about her grift looking for marks. <laughs> ah, ah, marks. Ah, oh, play on words. Very good. Very good. Except to listen, because uh -huh. I didn't think that I had a racial story. I didn't see how racism impacts me. You didn't consider yourself a racial being? How terrible of you. Golly, imagine moving through life and only considering yourself by who you are and not what you are. Evaluating yourself and others on their merits and their personal character. <laughs> God, what an antiquated notion. The second reason that I want to talk about whiteness is that I am in the field of education. and in Oh, no. Uh, are you a school teacher teaching kids about their racial identities? I hadn't anticipated this would be a curriculum of fear entry, but it just might turn out to be. In education, yeah. when we say we're going to talk about race yeah. in education, we end up scrutinizing... Uh -huh the outcomes of children and what? families of color. Okay, these camera cuts from one zoom in to the next and things, that's all the original video. It's got nothing to do with anything I did. And we don't talk about the fact that 85% of the teachers in our country are white. Oh, we talk about it. And by we, I mean those of us that pay attention to people like you who want to point out the race of the teachers as though that is some... I don't know, condemnation of their skills, abilities, or merits. That has what to do with what? I don't know. I hope you tell us. Thank you, Picard, the Driving Ape Man, for the on-set director's chair. I guess that is what I am. I'm both the producer and director and star of my own show. Which means I get to take all the blame. Which is, you know, fair enough. Most of our administrators in the country are white. Dun, dun, dun! Most of our teacher educators, like me, are white. Dun, dun, dun! Well, doesn't that mean you should quit? Doesn't that mean you should, like, I mean, at best, train up a replacement who is not white and just exit yourself from the entire endeavor? Because you are a part of the problem. If I'm understanding you when you say that white people are inherently problematic... She hasn't used the word yet, but that's the indication. Uh, thank you, Alyssa Holcomb should not be in current profession. You're not wrong. Uh, thank you, Gear PG, uh, for the dog cat fox. Good job. Well, I try my best. But yes, let's go over to the bingo card because as we've learned about our, our speaker's vocation, I think Alyssa brings up a good point. So free space is, is circled. Speakers should not be in current occupation. Yeah, Boy, the pepper jack hits quick for me because I'm a lightweight. Occupation or position. 
well, I mean, even if you don't take it by our own estimate of her having said what she said, by her own logic, she should not be in her position by dint of her, of her skin color. So yeah, those two are circled. Thank you, Pakal, driving it, man, again. Could be because most of our your country is white. I mean, odds are, odds are. Okay, plays victim, hasn't yet. Takes credit for something done by others, no. White supremacy privilege, not explicitly. We'll probably get there. Did she say privilege? I don't know. I don't think so. Uh, childhood family anecdote, not yet. Microaggression, no. Wage gap, no. Patriarchy, no. Attempt to coin new buzzword, buzz phrase, not yet. Word salad, not yet. Systemic institutional, not yet, although I suspect. Uh, toxic, not said. Anecdote that probably never happened, not yet. Leaves out vital context. Okay, we'll skip to the end here. Nothing else so far that has jumped out at me, but then we're only a minute 30 seconds in, so got to keep going, guys. Most of our policymakers are white. Yeah, yeah, Most yeah. of our curriculum writers and textbook writers are white. And what is that? Okay, okay, and, and I'm, I'm waiting for it. What does that say about the quality of their work? What does that say about who they are beyond what they are? Are you going to get to that point? So if we want to talk about race and education and we're not talking about whiteness, then we don't have the whole picture. Uh, Zach Osborne says institutional. Did she say it? I mean, now the hard and fast rules for bingo, there are some things you can extrapolate from what they've said. I try to look for the explicit statement first when it comes to like actual, you know, word squares and such. So did she say institutional? Did I miss it? I might have. She didn't say it. Okay, well, give it time. Give it time. We don't have to get the whole thing filled out in the first minute. Just, just let's give it a minute. Okay. So I didn't always talk like this. Oh, how did you talk? I grew up in a community called Mount Lebanon that was 99.8% white. It was a town, a suburb of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, what does that have to do with the way you talk? Did you have, did you have an accent that you lost? Or, or you just, or do you mean talking about whiteness, talking about race as though it's relevant to something? Is that what you mean? And in my family and in my community, we didn't talk about race. We were raised to be colorblind. Oh, colorblind, which as we all know now is a racist perspective. Yeah, wrap your head around that one. Uh, thank you, Drew W. Well, white people never lived their experience. I guess that might be true. I, I don't know. But yeah, remember, guys, uh, to not assess people on the basis of their skin color is denying that they are their skin color, which means that you are racist. At least that's the that's the rationale I've been provided, which is ridiculous, but that's what it is. And my parents are pretty phenomenal people. They have said that I can say anything that I want about our family and the way they raised me, if it means it's going to help people learn. Okay, childhood or family anecdote. Circling that one, moving on. Uh, which is very a, a very powerful permission they've given me. And my parents did wonderful things for us. We Each of the kids in my family studied abroad. We learned- Oh, I've studied several broads. <laughs> different languages. We also had foreign exchange students live with us throughout the years. We talked about multiculturalism and we were taught to value the content of a person's character, not the color of their skin. <gasps> oh my God. She said it out loud. I, okay. Well, all right. How do you come down from that? You, you, you've just quoted Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And the most simple and eloquent passage in that speech, well, Maybe the most famous, let's say. A anything that King, King did when he was given a speech was fa fairly eloquent. But the, the most vital component of his I Have a Dream speech, to assess people on the content of their character, not the color of their skin. That's what you were taught as a child growing up. Okay, so how and in what fashion did you decide 
that no longer worked for you. I, I'm very glad that she actually explicitly said that particular quote. Because everything from here on can very directly be assessed against that lesson that she was taught as a child. Okay? Uh, thank you, Johnny Hellcat. I'm waiting for the butt. Well, I'm always waiting for a butt of one kind or another. And we never talked about that one difference, which is racial. We never talked about racism. And so... Whoa, 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 whoa. The value of assessing someone on the content of their character and not the color of their skin directly addresses racism. It is the rejoinder to racism. It is the moral superior position to take against racism. What do you mean it does not address racism? You never addressed racism. Martin Luther King giving that speech was him addressing racism with that phrase. What are you talking about? Emphasizing a colorblind ideology meant we couldn't talk about racism. And if you had asked me, Allie, did you grow up in a segregated community? I would say no. We had 20 families of color and they lived among us and we were all friends. So you didn't live in a segregated community. Otherwise, there would be no one there but white people, would there be? I'm getting close to circling word salad because she's just gone from the epitome of what society should be doing in regards to race relations, i.e. ignoring race as a judgment factor in people, okay? And now she's telling us that that never happened. They never talked about race. Okay, I'm already confused and we're not even three minutes into this or just slightly over. Uh, thank you, stupid clown, for the donation. No comment. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I don't know where we can go from here, guys. She's already told us. She's already given the lie to her own introduction. She was taught... She was raised on the idea of colorblindness and content of character over color of skin. And now she's going to tell us how, what, she was, I don't know, dispelled of that childhood, childish uh, notion? I, I'm just, God, I can't, even, I can't even form words at just how ridiculous this sounds. Uh, thank you, John Miller. Her mind has segregated from her brain. Okay, so did you live in a segregated community? No, we had people who weren't white in our community. Okay, so you didn't live in a segregated community, correct? Um, it wasn't segregated. Yeah, but... But what I couldn't see at that time was that I couldn't zoom out and see that I lived in a community that was almost 100% white. Almost 100%. Uh-huh. And we live 10 miles from the hill in Pittsburgh where all of August Wilson's plays take place. August Wilson? I don't know who August Wilson is. It was almost 100% black. Uh-huh. But your neighborhood wasn't segregated. You just told us. And we didn't mix. We didn't talk to each other. We didn't play each other in sports. We didn't drink. You just said that the families in your community who weren't white lived among you and you mingled and so on. What are you talking about? From the same proverbial water fountain. And so we were segregated, but I couldn't... No, you, you just said you weren't. You just said you weren't. And you weren't if you had people who were not white living in your community. If you had people who were not of your race living in your own neighborhood, then you did not live in a segregated neighborhood. What? I'm circling word salad because if not now, eventually. Holy cats, guys. See that? Yeah. So I went to college with this colorblind lens. This you did? Okay, good for you. <clears throat> and what made you change your mind about 
assessing people on their skin color. Sense that race really doesn't matter. That yeah, you're right. Race really doesn't matter. The white, my whiteness has never impacted my life. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it didn't. Maybe it did. I have no idea. But you are, you are darn sure. In in, <laughs> God, I just. I'm sorry, guys. It's just th this amount of self contradiction and brainlessness has just really thrown me for a loop. And we're not even a couple minutes into this. So if nothing else, I sort of look at this as a microcosm of what's going on in her head daily as she moves through the world. And that is a scary picture. And I was required to take a course on diversity. Required? Okay. How, how long ago did you go to college? Because being required to take a course on diversity seems far more 2010s-ish. And I'm a big fan of diversity requirements because I would not have taken this course if it hadn't been required. Not because I didn't think it was important, not because I wasn't interested, but because I didn't feel like I belonged there. Right, because you were someone who didn't assess people on their skin color. That was the values and virtues with which you were raised. So you weren't wrong in thinking you didn't need to be there. <clears throat> okay. It was the first time I ever had a black professor. It was the first time I ever had black classmates. It was African-American literature. And I spent the whole first part of the semester being totally intimidated by the content. I had to say words that I had never said out loud before, like white and black. Okay, anecdote that probably never happened. I never had to say these words before. You went all the way through your entire life in America, I am assuming, and never once prior to college had you ever talked about or been talked to about, or heard or discussed race relations in the country, ever. You didn't learn about the civil rights movement in junior high or high school. You had no idea. It was all alien to you until you got to college. You lived in a completely cloistered and sheltered life in the suburbs of, what was it, Philadelphia or something, or Pittsburgh? Right, sure, I totally believe you. And racism, and I could feel my tongue swelling in my mouth. I <laughs> I was drinking just then. You could feel your tongue swelling in your mouth. Was your tongue stung by a bee? What? I would trip and bumble and stumble and over the words white and black? I mean, did you ever own a box of crayons? I, I, I had this professor who was, he, he would do things like he would tell a, race, a racist joke. <gasps> he would do what? And then half the class would laugh. And then he'd say, that was a racist joke. You don't laugh at racist jokes. You have to think before you laugh. <laughs> oh. And so I would sit there thinking, like, really, every time he said anything, I would think, am I supposed to laugh now? Am I not supposed to laugh? How does not laughing look? I honestly spent much of the day. You spent much of the day policing your own thoughts, walking on eggshells around everything and everyone, second guessing any thought that you had on the off chance that you might offend someone or you might say the wrong thing to the wrong person because of the color of their skin. Is that what you spent your day doing? Is that what you've spent your life doing since then? Feeling constantly paranoid over anything you might think or do? Golly, what a what a wondrous life you must lead. Uh, thank you, John Miller. Wow, she makes a stellar cultist. She makes a stellar uh, self-wretched individual. You know, in, in many of my videos, especially my early videos, 
I could not help but draw comparisons between the philosophy of original sin in Catholicism and, and elsewhere, and the uh, the constant notions that being a certain color imbues you with a certain responsibility and or guilt and or crime. And I think insofar as that Kool-Aid is concerned, she's taken several healthy gulps of it. In class thinking like, do I look more racist if I cross my legs this way or if I cross my legs this way? Uh, it's the first one. And it was all this very self-focused analysis trying to figure out how do I show up here? I have no practice being in this conversation. Yeah, so every time you encounter someone who isn't white, you need to presume that they need you to act in a certain way because they're so fragile that anything you might do is going to break them. You know, because, because of the color of your skin. You know, both, both in TEDx talks and other videos and people in my own real life who I've unfortunately learned live to a certain extent under the same mentality I can't help but try, at least for a moment, to imagine what it must be like to live in that world that you've constructed around yourself, where simply being what you are is something that you have to apologize for, something you have to compensate for, and that anyone who doesn't look like you is someone who is going to be inherently victimized simply by your existence. And so you have to make all of these complex moves and considerations and second guessings and guilt trips of yourself just to just to walk down the street. I, I honestly don't know how anybody functions that way. And, and maybe we're observing that right now. That semester we read 14 novels by African-American authors. And by the end of the semester, I had learned two really important things that have stayed with me for my life. Uh-oh, two things, a list. It might be only a list of two, but it's a list. Okay, let me know. What are the two things you learned? One is that racism has impacted every day of this country since the first colonists stepped foot on the shores of the United States. <sighs> uh-huh. Okay. And you're helping alleviate that persistent and chronic disease of thinking by vilifying people on the basis of their skin color. Got it. Now, thank you, Drew W. Sorry, I'm 90% military vet. Take my money. <laughs> you don't have to apologize for being 90% military vet. Um, if anything, you know, I should be apologizing to you. But uh, anyway, moving on. Which was not then the United States. We call them colonists because that word is linked to the word colonizer. Racism is a huge part of our history. And whiteness is not incidental to who I am as a white person. It's not? The, the nature of your skin color isn't just dumb luck of genetics? And here we go with the racial identitarianism again. The color of her skin is important. It needs to be noticed. It needs to be valued. It is an integral part of who she is, not what she is, who she is. The exact same philosophy as promoted by white supremacists since the beginning, or racial supremacists in general. But okay, lady, you tell me how it is that your skin color is not incidental to who you are. I'm dying to know. Thank you, Andrew W., a crippled vet, and don't apologize. Uh, I mean, in insofar as we end up in situations where our, our men and women, our fighting women, men and women, are put in harm's way. You know, I, 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 I don't know. 
I don't know where I'm going with that. Sort of hoping for a, a world where we didn't have to go to war, where people's lives were put on the line for land and so on and so forth. But what do I know? That's just history and reality. There are no utopias, but I'm sure our speaker is trying to push us towards one of her own. It's not just a peripheral piece. Whiteness is integral to who I am and who my ancestors are. I, and and I, I am not, I'm not being facetious. And I don't think I'm being hyperbolic when I say this. There are quotations from white supremacists in that Gathering Storm book. Because what they did was they sent, uh, let's say for the sake of argument, the, the secret agents into these white supremacist rallies and meetings and things with recorders, and they would transcribe the speeches made by these guys, okay, to sort of show this is the ide ideology that's being promoted by these groups. I don't think I'm too far off in saying that the kind of language she is using right now in 2020 as some sort of virtuous declaration of understanding of her inherent fault is the exact same kind of rhetoric that was coming out of white supremacist leaders in the 1990s in the KKK and other neo-Nazi organizations. I mean, you, you, could, you could take one and move it to the other, and you probably wouldn't have to do much work to make it sound exactly like what they were talking about, promoting themselves as white versus this lady deprecating herself for being white. And both of them involve racial identity. One might be elevating it and one might be denigrating it, but that's beside the point because all it is is setting aside everything and saying that skin color comes first, which is insane. And yet, I proceed. Racism has impacted my life every day of my life and since before I was born. Racism has impacted every day of your life since before you were born. You know what? I'm going to circle, make something about race, sex, etc. for no reason. If you're making something about race that impacts your life before you existed, yeah, there's no reasoning for that one. I know I might be a little fast and loose with that one, but honestly, I'm feeling generous today for some reason. My ancestors are part of that history of colonization. My ancestors who immigrated here were allowed to immigrate in part because of their whiteness. Okay, and now I'm going to circle the one where it says, takes credit for something done by others in their demographic. Well, since white is all her demographic, <clears throat> excuse me, and she's taking responsibility after a fashion for the evils done by people in her past, which fit into her demographic, I'm circling that one too, because why not? My ancestors were able to get jobs, were able to join unions, were able to bust unions because of their whiteness. Uh, bust unions, you say? Uh, were those unions populated by other white people by any chance? I mean, did any of your ancestors take such actions that would be detrimental to other white people or just people in general for their own personal gain or vice versa, doing, doing noble things that benefited lots of people regardless of their race? Is, is, is there anything you want to not take credit for? They were counted in the founding document of our country, the Constitution. My ancestors were counted as whole people. <coughs> Black people were counted as three-fifths of a person. That's part of the founding document of our country. Yeah, it's part of the founding document of our country. And it's totally in practice today, isn't it? Nothing has changed. The document in and of itself and the mechanisms therein did not allow for those things to be changed and revised and overwritten at all. Nothing has changed since 1789. Okay. Yeah, you know, it, sure, sure. Nothing's changed. Everything's the same. Got it. That not every person would be whole in this country. Yeah, and, and it's still the same today, isn't it? Isn't it? 
that whiteness has impacted my life, my community, my, my segregated community that I thought was integrated. You did not live in a segregated community. Non-white people were not disallowed from living in your community. You told us just a few minutes ago, a scant few minutes ago, that that was not the case. What are you talking about? White communities, all white communities don't happen by accident. But I didn't know about the legislation and the policy and the banking strategies. All of those things that had families living in your neighborhood who weren't white, you mean, right? Thank you, John Miller. And don't forget that it was the three-fifths compromise. They were discussing freedom in the beginning as well, but that little fact is ignored. Well, discussing and what ended up in law are two different things. I mean, we can look back and say, oh, the merits of some of their intentions or their thoughts or their counterpoints, but ultimately what ended up in law ended up in law. So, you know, we can't we can't deny history, obviously. But also, should we not just acknowledge that history is not the present? How many times have I done videos or seen arguments and articles about how everything's terrible and referencing things that are defunct in law? whether it's the Immigration Act of 1917 or whatever, or the original laws on three-fifths and so on. Yeah, they exist. They're part of our country's history. It's true. It's very true. But isn't it more striking to know that they are no longer valid, that our country has evolved, that the laws we have passed and the amendments we've given since then say more about our acknowledgement of our past sins than they do about enshrining them? God forbid. Uh, thank you again, Drew W. Slave slash indentured servitude were three-fifths, not blacks. Okay, I'm not a constitutional scholar. I'll take your word for it. I don't know, and I'm not, I'm not calling you a liar or something. I don't have the text of the laws in my head at present, but... Uh, there you go. <sighs> okay. And uh, mortgage lending practices and individual violence that went into preserving the whiteness of all white communities. Except yours, which wasn't all white because there were families in your community who were not white, like you just told us. So there's no evidence to put doubt to your declaration in your own personal history. You'll hearken back to your long dead ancestors and what they may or may not have done, but you're going to ignore the reality of your own lifetime. Okay. Sounds good. That likely happened before I was even born, but that impacted the fact that I went to a school yeah. that was considered safe, that uh -huh. was considered a blue ribbon school uh -huh. and from which I could go to college and my parents could pay for my college because of the housing market that we were able to buy into because of our whiteness. Okay, the video and the sound just desynced for some reason. I don't know why, but it did. So if you're watching this live, it's nothing I did as far as I can tell. But uh, okay, so wait, your parents had to pay for college. But I mean, your parents are white, aren't they? <laughs> Maybe I missed something. Your, your parents had to expend their resources to put you through school? It wasn't just handed to you? It wasn't just handed to them? Oh, okay. Whiteness was integral to my life. Okay, and now the sound suddenly syncs up again. Whoever was filming this TEDx, a little odd, a little odd. The second lesson that I learned, and after oh, it's only we're only on number two. Okay, we're only on the second lesson. Okay, let me back up a second because I just did cut her off. Okay, whiteness was integral yeah. to my life. Yeah, yeah. The second lesson that I learned mm -hmm. in African American literature is that I can get better at talking about race. At the beginning of that semester, I was so bad at talking about race. 
you were so bad because it wasn't an issue before by your own telling. You were colorblind. You were brought up on the content of character over color of skin. You were so bad at it because it wasn't a part of your thinking. You moved through the world not assessing people on the color of their skin. God forbid. But now this class has taught you the error of your ways. Okay. Okay. And by the end of that semester, I was still so bad at talking about race. But you kept talking about it and talking about it and talking about it. And now you're an educator who talks about it and talks about it and talks about it. Because the way to overcome racism, you see, is to constantly focus on skin color. But I was better than I had been, and I could see the way that practice made it possible for me to get better, that this is a skills-based competency. Yes, it's true. Racism is a skills-based competency. I, I totally agree with you. And that I can grow. And so I went on to take every class I could with that professor. I became an Africana studies minor. I studied abroad in South Africa. And oh, you studied abroad in South Africa? I've studied several broads in America. I don't know how many times I'm going to make that joke, but probably a lot. Uh, thank you again, John Miller. She is still so bad at it. <sighs> that she's doing it at all says a lot about her. But moving on. And when I was in South Africa, I met a black feminist. <laughs> all right. Feminism. Feminism. Uh I would have also brought up uh, at that point, make something about race for no reason, because who cares what your skin color is, whether you're a feminist, you know, but at the, we're, we're so far beyond that at this point, it really doesn't matter. And I've already circled it. Uh, South African activist named Gertrude Nonswagazi Squentu, and she asked me to li write her life story. She asked you to write her life story? Why? I I'm honestly curious. So after college, I spent two years working with her, recording the stories of her life and how racialized policy had impacted her as a black child growing up in apartheid South Africa. Yeah, growing up in apartheid South Africa, I can see where racism was a major factor in her life. Um, so uh, not knowing the age of our speaker, was she born any time after 1964? Did she come of age after the Civil Rights Act of 1964? I'm just curious. Because she did not grow up in apartheid South Africa. Maybe she grew up in the South. Maybe her lifetime overlaps the worst uh, or the apex before the end of legalized racial discrimination in our country. I don't know. But uh, yeah, a little bit of a tangent there, but I'm just curious. And through that relationship and through that project, I started to get angry. I was so angry. Angry at apartheid? Yeah, apartheid sucked. Thank goodness it's gone. But let's not distinguish people by their skin color anymore, huh? Right? About racism. And I was uncomfortable and ashamed of being white. Okay. I'm circling benevolent condescension because uh, if she hasn't already, and in a couple places she has, she's letting all of us white people know that, you know, we've got work to do. And at the same time, she's also condescending in the reverse to anybody who isn't white because obviously they're disempowered. They are incapable. They are victims inherently because of what they are. And you know what? I'm going to circle plays victim too, because she's just victimized herself. She felt so bad about being white. Yep. I'm being very generous today, I think. Um, now, by the end of this, if she doesn't say the words white supremacy or privilege, I'm probably going to circle it just because that notion has been threaded through almost everything she's said so far. 
So we'll see. And I was sad and I felt guilt. And then I decided what I'm going to do is I'm going to show up to the table of racial conversations and I'm going to feel guilty. That's what I can do for racial justice. <laughs> Okay, I, I I really hope this is a self-imposed sort of uh, deprecation because what she just said there has more tr truth to it than maybe she is going to acknowledge. Showing up and feeling guilty for being white is really part and parcel of the process being promoted today. So is she joking? Is she making light of herself? No pun intended. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to feel guilty. And whenever possible, I'm going to make all the other white people feel guilty. Uh-huh. Which is totally not what you're currently doing, right? You're not currently totally denigrating and accusing people of how, somehow being flawed and participating in racism unknowingly or otherwise because of their skin color. You're standing on a stage where the title of your presentation is, how can I have a positive racial identity? I'm white. And now you're making light of the notion of making white people feel guilty for being white. How many dimensions do you inhabit? And that's what I'm going to do. And what I found was that I, I would see people on the street who'd been in my classes or who I'd had conversations with, and they'd, they'd kind of duck into stores at the last minute so they didn't have to see me coming. <laughs> no, no, no. They weren't ducking into stores because they didn't see you coming. They ducked into stores because they saw you coming. They, they saw you coming and they knew you were a converted zealot as a racial denigrationist. And they wanted to stay away from you because they knew what you were going to say and do. Because you embraced it wholeheartedly, your inherent and self-inflicted shame and the shame that you wanted to project on anyone else around you who happened to be of the wrong skin color. You know, I'm going to coin a new buzz phrase, racial denigrationist, okay? I don't even know if that exists. I don't even know if denigrationist is a word, but it's it's a word now. You know, if we're, we're going to have live in a world where new words and new definitions are come up with every day, there you go. A racial denigrationist, not a, not a white supremacist or a racial supremacist, a racial denigrationist, someone who goes out to shame others more often than not of their own racial demographic into feeling bad about themselves because they are part of that racial demographic. That That's my new buzz phrase. I'm not going to circle on the bingo card. Well, I mean, if it's the last square before we get to a bingo, maybe I'll self-inflict it, but that's my new buzz phrase. Racial denigrationist. That's what she is, and that's what they were running from. And, and there was a moment where I just thought, this has not been a victory for racial justice. Racial justice, justice predicated on skin color. Tell me more. The way that I'm doing this is not working. I need to recalibrate. I need to be more subtle, more covert in my denigrationism. And about that time, I read a book by a black psychologist, Janet Helms, who writes about... The what does her skin color have to do with her being a psychologist? Can't her ideas taken on their own merits, just be considered? Well, what does her skin color have to do with that? Might I ask? The importance of a positive racial identity. And she says, white people need to get a positive racial identity. And I remember thinking, what is a positive racial identity? How can I have a positive racial identity? A positive racial identity is one in which you set your racial identity above all others. Or is better than others. <laughs> you know... Racial supremacy. I mean, I don't know. Maybe she'll give me another definition of what, quote unquote, a positive racial identity is, except valuing your own skin color as an inherent benefit. 
which of course is what we want everybody to be to be acting like in a modern society, correct? I'm white. You know, just feeling good about being white because you're white, that sounds like some white supremacist stuff. Oh my God. Oh my God. You're absolutely right. Holy cow. The, the lack of self-awareness, the inherent contradiction, the cognitive dissonance between at one hand being raised on the idea of colorblindness and character over skin color, and saying, no, 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 I was totally wrong about that, to coming across, how can I have a positive racial identity? Doesn't that sound a little white supremacist? Speaking of which, circle white supremacy and privilege, she said it. Uh, yeah, it does, doesn't it? I, I can't wait to hear your counter argument to that one. Thank you, point curation. Use words you think are useful. English words are made up of smaller pieces that you can rearrange within loose rule sets, like ethno-nationalism. Yeah, thank you so much for the donation. Yes, I know, I know. The English language is very flexible. Insofar as something is understood, it is successful language to a certain extent. So if I say um, uh, racial uh, denigrationalist, you get what I'm saying. It might not be proper English, it might be might, might not be existing English, but it's understood. So anyway, a copyright, if that ends up on a t-shirt somewhere, I want my bit. No, oh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong thing. And Janet Helms writes, yes, a positive racial identity for white people is not about just feeling good about being white because you're white. Then what is it? Because I, I don't know, because simply being a skin color says nothing else about who you are. It, it is just a, a reflex of genetics um, or, or, or environment to some extent. So, so what is a positive racial identity? I, this, is, this is the entire reason I picked out this TEDx talk. I want to hear this theory. That's some white supremacist stuff. Y yeah, it is. So what is the alternative consideration there? If not elevating yourself or feeling good about yourself simply on the basis of your race, i.e. a racial identity, what is it? A positive racial identity is not about feeling good about being white. It's also not about feeling bad about being white. Then what is it? It's about understanding what it means to be white in the context of a heavily racially, racialized society that has historically and still today distributes resources and opportunities inequitably favoring white people against people of color. I... Having a positive racial identity is not feeling good because you're white. It's not feeling bad because you're white. It's understanding that because you're white, you're part of the inherent problem of all things in society. That's a positive racial identity. So positive in this context is confession, right? It's confession of inherent sin. A positive racial identity, insofar as white people are concerned, is accepting your inherent wretchedness. It's not about feeling bad. It's just taking responsibility for your inherent flaw. Is that what I am to understand? Because that sounds like what you are saying understanding what it means to live in a society that teaches people of color internalized oppression and teaches white people internalized superiority. So the reverse and cure to this is to teach people of color internalized superiority and to teach white people internalized oppression. That's how you balance the scales, right? Just assuming to know what someone's place in society should be or how they should feel or what to think about them based on their skin color. 
you want to segregate the thinking of people on the basis of race is what you're saying. I don't know if you'll admit to that, but that is what you are doing. And dealing with that sense of internalized superiority so that I can show up and be and live in healthy multiracial community with people of color in which we work against racism and other oppressions, knowing that all oppressions are connected. You wanna work against racism by having white people possess a positive racial identity in which they inherently acknowledge that they have internalized superiority because they're white and that people who are not white possess internalized oppression because they're not white in a society that is tilted in favor of white people and against non-white people, this is how you're going to oppose racism. Got it. That's what having a positive racial identity is for a white person. A negative racial identity is what I had when I was growing up. When you were growing up and raised under the principles of colorblindness, character before skin color, that's a negative racial identity. The absence of a racial consideration in your interactions with other people and your assessment of other people. That is a negative racial identity. Got it. A negative racial identity is not about feeling bad for being white. It's about having no consciousness that being white has impacted your life. <sighs> If you've noticed a change in my tone in the last couple of minutes from one of a little bit of, I don't know, sardonic hilarity to one of seriousness and almost depression, it's because that, that has changed. Hearing this, knowing that she is not alone in thinking this, and more so knowing that she is an educator conceivably promoting this to children, Maybe it's a good thing I'm drinking alone or not. It's about attempting to be colorblind and not seeing how racism operates. It's a negative, a negative racial identity is necessarily a delusional identity. Being colorblind is not the same thing as thinking that racism doesn't exist. Being colorblind is a personal perspective on other people. It does not make you somehow ignorant of reality, unless somehow you choose to be. Being colorblind as a principle is to not assess someone on the basis of their race, is to not use race as a judgment factor when encountering someone. That's what being colorblind is. It is an active opposition to the notion of racism. It in fact acknowledges that racism exists because you're saying, I'm not going to be someone who does not judge someone on their character. This lady's entire interpretation of what she says she was raised with insofar as assessing someone on the content of their character and not the color of their skin on the basis of being colorblind is so bizarre and yet so common because what she is saying, how she is characterizing the notion of colorblindness is not unique. This is the same kind of argument I've heard over and over again. Redefining the principle of colorblindness to be someone who just lives in Willful ignorance that racism exists. Yeah. And to be colorblind is to be willfully ignorant of the evils of the world. Rather than actively practicing a philosophy that inherently counters a particular evil of the world. 
So yeah, if I sound a little depressed right now, it's because I am a little depressed right now. Uh, thank you, John Miller. She is one to talk. She can't even see her own racism. Talk about obtuse. Yeah. It's the fighting fire with fire notion. Except she doesn't even see it as fighting fire with fire. She thinks that she is water when she's actually gasoline. What does that tell you? Because there are so many racial myths and stereotypes that circulate in our society. Yeah, like all white people are inherently privileged. That the education system being populated in the majority by white people is somehow then broken or corrupted or inadequate because of the skin color of the participants. Though, you know, those kind of stereotypes, right? Right? If you don't have the lens that's able to see, that's a myth, that's a lie, that's a stereotype, you believe them. And it the lack of self-awareness on the part of the speaker is absolutely stunning. It clouds your lens, and so you're unable to see the world clearly. You need a little bit of a microfiber rag for your glasses, lady. Because your lenses are decidedly opaque. So I became very interested in figuring out at one point, how do you talk to white kids about race? Oh, Christ. Because I was pregnant with my first child and I part of my work involved standing on stages and talking about how badly my parents had taught me about race. Yeah, you're a, uh, you're a career racist, are you? Why am I not surprised? Yeah, do tell me, how do you talk to white kids about race? And I, you know, that's very easy to say, well, look at what my parents got wrong. What a look at what your parents got wrong. Raising you in a household that did not assess people on the basis of color. Oh my God, your parents, how dare they? What am I supposed to teach my daughter? I had this experience in Target when she was a baby. And when she was a baby, okay. And um, we're just going through the aisles and she has white, white hair and blue eyes. And white hair and blue eyes. So she's platinum blonde and blue eyes. Okay, your baby, your innocent, tiny, Baby, please continue. And people were always stopping me to say, oh, she looks like such a doll baby. And one day I just snapped, she was about eight months old, and I said, you know what? The reason my baby looks like a doll baby is because we live in a white supremacist society in which all the doll babies have blonde hair and blue eyes. If we could live in a society in which we could honor and acknowledge the multiplicity and diversity of skin colors and hair textures and the beauty of humanity, then maybe my baby wouldn't look so much like a doll baby and maybe she would just look like a regular old baby. You know? I just let that play out without comment because... I'm not sure I could add anything to it that isn't already said. I, your own baby, your own child. That's how you see your own child. This might be one of the most depressing TEDx talks I've ever looked at. Bit by bit, minute by minute. Thank you, Johnny Hellcat. Error does not compute. Now, my brain's already there, I think. And thank you, this is Kyle. Thank you for this, Scribe. I've been thinking of doing a rant on the topic of the racist, racisms later today and needed a little bit of inspiration to get me in the ranting mood. Uh, well, I, you know, on the one hand, I am, I'm glad I was your muse in this instance. On the other hand, I wish I hadn't been, if you catch my meaning. But thank you so much for, your, for the donation. Yeah. That is an applause line. Let's just, just muse on that for a second, shall we?
Okay, so it makes a good story, but the woman just looked at me. You said this to a person. If I didn't, if I hadn't already circled anecdote that probably never happened, I would be doing so just now. You said that entire insane, zealotrous tirade to an individual person who complimented the beauty of your own child. Sure you did. Uh, thank you, Point Curation. Living in clown world makes me suicidal sometimes. No, no. And, and just, and I know you're kidding. I, I, hope, I hope you're kidding. But just as a, a brief tangent, um, do not, do not get down if this angers you, if this infuriates you, if this bewilders you at the very least. Um, because as far as I'm concerned, you have a mind that can oppose this stuff. And we need more people to listen to this kind of argumentation, to parse it out, and to, if not actively, then at least through your own actions in life, oppose it by example. So do not, do not subtract yourself from the worldly equation. Please do not. Please don't. Uh, thank you, Corey Suzuki. Have another Pepper Jack scribe. You're going to need it. I, you know, I've only got the one. Well, it's almost done now. But I'm probably going to need another one after this because, man, this is... Whew. You know? And I looked at her, and I remember thinking, this, too, has not been a victory for racial justice. Really? Because you seem so proud of this interaction. You're making light of this interaction. Why don't you feel bad about it? So with a research team uh, that, that I had worked with throughout grad school involving Howard Stevenson and Keisha Bentley Edwards and, and Eleonora Bartoli, we started looking into how white families talk to their kids about race. If only you had looked at your own family who promoted And I'm going to use the words because they make more sense in the context of what her family promoted. Racial justice, racial fairness in that race is irrelevant. If only you had looked to your own childhood for inspiration as to how to move through the world and inspire others. But no, no, what your parents did was a mistake. And you needed to act better by teaching children how to assess each other and themselves on their skin color? Or, or have I misunderstand, mis <laughs> Pepper Jack, have I misunderstood you to this point? And the amazing thing is that what we found is that most of the families we interviewed and the teens that we interviewed talked to their children about race the same way that my parents did. God forbid. They don't teach them anything about whiteness. Whiteness is incidental to who they are. It doesn't matter. Racism is bad, but racism is also a violent individual action on the part of a self-declared racist, like a, somebody from the KKK. I feel like I'd just be repeating myself at this point. There's no talk of the systems and the history of... Okay, well, systemic, system, systemic, institutional, circling, systemic. Racism that was in place before any of the children that we're even interviewing were born. People are learning that they should be... Yeah, you know, God forbid that parents try to instill in their children values that go against the kind of thinking, the kind of laws the kind of conduct that came years before so that they can move through the world operating absent the past discriminations of our very awkward and very embarrassing cultural past. God forbid that they do that.
and that their kids can move into the world, into those same institutions and systems, and not assess people on the basis of race. No, you have to swoop in and remind them, no, no, you have to talk about race. You have to point out the differences. You have to make them feel bad or victimized or oppressed on the basis of what they look like. You have to have them move through the world assessing themselves and everybody else on the basis of skin color. We can't forget the past. We have to repeat it over and over again so we can be good people now. <sighs> be colorblind, that they shouldn't talk about race, that talking about race is racist. I think I could say something there, but I think I've just said it very, very angrily. But one of the things that I've been learning is that when we don't talk about race, what we do is we make it possible for the status quo to exist how it is. We can't rectify any of these historical wrongs if we're not able to talk about it. You're not talking about it. You are instilling it. You right the wrongs of the past by not repeating the same mistakes thereof. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 and every law to either precede it or succeed it that dealt with illegaling, illegaling, or whatever, you know what I mean, racial discrimination is a confession of our past sins. It's not a cure. It's an acknowledgement of what we did wrong. And as much of a promise as we can make in this country that we are going to work to right that wrong in the future. You are not righting that wrong by going to parents who are teaching the concept of colorblindness who are trying to instill in their children the concept of character versus skin color. You do not right that wrong by saying that's bullshit. You need to think the way we do by elevating skin color to a first and foremost consideration. This lady is making me so fucking mad. <sighs> Thank you, Call the Driving Ape Man. She's insane. Jesus fucking Christ. I, you know, I'd use the word useful idiot here. But the unfortunate thing is she's not an idiot. And she's also teaching children. So I continue to search for answers for how I talk to white people about race and how I talk to my children about race. A couple years ago, my daughter, who she was five, two years ago, she she was five. Okay, I just want to keep that in mind. A five-year-old, your five-year-old doll-like daughter, wherein any such compliments coming her way have to be dispelled, disparaged, and dismissed. And that was at eight months old. Your five-year-old daughter, go on. She decided she wanted to dye her hair purple. And I'm thinking, this sounds good to me. Um, so I was talking to my friend Gertrude from South Africa on the phone. Okay. Your five-year-old daughter wants to dye her hair purple. I mean, on its face, sounds adorable. Okay. And you were talking to your friend from South Africa. Uh, I, if I'm remembering correctly, the one who asked you to write her autobiography for whatever reason. Okay. Phone. We talk every couple of weeks, and and I said, so Tina wants to dye her hair purple, and Gertrude said, um, oh, interesting. What do you think? And I said, I think it seems good. I think it seems like a healthy detachment from her blondness. Her blondness. So 
So now the color of her hair. The color of her hair. As relevant a factor in assessing someone's character as their skin color. It is a healthy pursuit to move away from her blondness at five years old. Oh, and I'm certain, I am certain that your five-year-old was thinking about changing her hair color to purple in order to get away from her blondness. I have little doubt that whatever self-hatred you instilled in your children from the day of their birth on the basis of what they are had some effect in her wanting to dye her hair purple to get away from her blondness. And Gertrude said, what'd you say? Yeah, well, I'm with Gertrude, at least in reaction. But I don't know about the content because I haven't heard the details yet. And it doesn't matter where she comes from or what she looks like. Or, or, or does it? And I should have known that I was in trouble. The minute she asked me to repeat myself, I should have known. Because when a person who's not white criticizes you, obviously you're a bad person. Right? Right? That's what you've learned? You have to be constantly second-guessing anything and everything you say around anybody who doesn't look like you on the off chance that you're being a bad white person? Or, or, or am I jumping the gun here? But I thought it was a bad connection, so I'm like, I think it's a healthy detachment from her blondness. And Gertrude's like, yeah, I thought that's what you said. And she said, listen to me, Allie, your daughter was made by her creator, blonde hair, blue eyes, light skin, pink cheeks. That is her vessel. How is she supposed to repair the world if she's broken, if she's detached from any part of who she is? How is she supposed to love people if, she can, if she's not fully loved? How is she supposed to show up and help other people become whole if she doesn't feel whole? Yeah. You know, like when someone compliments your daughter on how pretty they are and they look like a doll, and then you go on a long-winded tirade over how wrong-thinking that person is to compliment the beauty of your daughter. How your instinctual reaction to your daughter wanting to dye her hair purple was, it's good that she's trying to get away from her blondness. Even after your college experience, even after all your work in trying to talk better about racism, you still can't get it right, can you? You still can't get it right. You're still wrong. Because someone who doesn't look like you corrected you. You can't look at your five-year-old daughter whimsically wanting to change her hair to purple probably because she saw it on some cartoon or something, as just a fun thing for a kid to do. No, you had to invest into it a racial consideration. You had to invest into it a flaw that your daughter inherently possesses requiring correction. You did that all by yourself. Thank you, Pakal, the driving ape man. Genetics made her like you, not a creator. Well, I'm not going to disparage someone's religious beliefs, whatever. Because as far as I can tell in this context, her friend in South Africa was on the right page, sort of. Insofar as there's nothing to correct, which was her mother's interpretation of the act of dyeing her hair purple as far as what her mission should be in the absence of that change, I don't know that I agree with it as someone has to be some sort of change agent, some sort of activist based on what they are to change an inherent assumption about the flaws of other people based on what they are. But anyway. Herself. Yeah. 
And I know that she's right. You know that she's right? Then why were you saying she should change her blondness before? You know that she's right, why? Why do you know that she's right? Now, I don't know if our speaker is going to say, but I have a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> I don't know why I have it. That our speaker's assessment of her friend's rightness has more to do with her with what her friend looks like than inherently what her friend thinks like. And her words guide me in the work that I do. When I think about talking to my children, when I think about talking with teachers and in communities, what is the point of talking about race and racism? I have absolutely no idea. Tell me. The point is to see the way that racism has fractured us as a country, as a community, as individuals. Fractured us. Fractured us. Like looking at your own daughter, looking at your own innocent baby toddler daughter and assessing her as inherently flawed. Disparaging any compliment that comes her way. Thinking that getting rid of her blondness would be a good thing. Yeah. Tell me more, would you? Would you please tell me more about the evils of racism? Thank you, John Miller. This woman lacks the capacity to think for herself. Yeah. She needed someone else to tell her that dyeing a child's hair was not covering up an imperfection. So imagine, in the five years prior to that phone call, the five years that her daughter had been alive in her care, what kind of perspective her own mother had on her based on what she looked like. Can you imagine that? I mean, I have a pretty active imagination. I can imagine it. And it is a goddamn horror story. And to work to repair and heal those fractures in multiracial solidarity, in community, to build a world in which race truly doesn't matter. What? What? No! No! Fuck! Your parents raised you with that principle. And you just, a few minutes ago, said that that was a mistake on their part. That you needed to do better than your parents. The color blindness. Character versus skin color. Those were, those were bad ideas. Those promoted a, a bad sense of racial identity. Oh, but now you want a world where skin color doesn't matter. Oh, well... Is that the world you're working towards? Oh, she of in, insulting her own daughter, seeing her daughter's hair color as a flaw that needs to be covered up and it would be a healthy thing if she did so. Really? Really? Oh my God. But not because we refuse to see it, not because we were colorblind, not because we turned away, but because we looked at that historical legacy and we stared it right in the eye and we examined what it did to us. And then we worked together in community to fix it. And I think that, that could be a victory for racial justice. Thank you. No, no, you, you didn't look it in the eye. You didn't look it in the eye. You gave it a big, sloppy kiss. You, you didn't confront it. 
you didn't oppose it. You looked at it as the right way to see the world and to see other people. The right way to evaluate your own children. That is a motor bleeding out in the background, if you can hear it. I don't know, guys. I don't know. I More so than most TEDx's I think I've watched recently, at least. If you couldn't tell, uh, this one has particularly angered me. Um, and, and, and even beyond the rhetoric itself, which is so insane, incoherent, contradictory, more so the fact that our speaker works in education. She's teaching children, I mean, not, setting aside her own. And I feel a certain level of sorrow for her children, if that's how she sees them. She sees them as little agents of evil that need to be corrected that she is most likely instilling these same kinds of notions into children, at the same time arguing to their parents that her perspective is a healthy one and a virtuous one. <sighs> okay. Okay. Let's try to bring ourselves back to some level of levity, if nothing else. Going over the bingo card, here is what I have circled so far for your reference. I will take arguments for the contrary or to include others after this. Uh, plays victim, yes. She's a victim of her own skin color. Takes credit for something done by others. Uh, credit or blame. I should probably revise the card to say that. Blame, yeah. Uh, white supremacy privilege, she brought that up. Childhood or family anecdote, she brought that up. Word salad, certainly. Systemic, she talked about systems. Anecdote that probably never happened. Her yelling that tirade against the woman who complimented her daughter. Uh, that, that she snapped at somebody, sure. That she did so in that particular litany of things, I doubt it. Uh, free space circled, of course. Speaker should not be in current occupation or position, certainly. Uh, make something about race, sex, etc. for no reason. You could count a zillion things in this talk. Feminism, she brought up her friend in Africa, South Africa, sorry. Uh, benevolent condescension, oh, you know, you poor white people, you don't know you're bad, but I'll teach you how you are. And a list. So let me go over the other squares real quick. Microaggression, never brought it up or the concept thereof. Wage gap, never came up. Patriarchy, never mentioned. Attempt to coin new buzzword, buzz phrase, not to my knowledge. Uh, I'll take arguments elsewise because that would get us a bingo. Toxic. She never said the word, uh, leaves out vital context. Um, God, I know she did at one point or another, but I've been so caught up in the last couple of minutes of just absolute frustration and anger that I've probably forgotten the specifics. Chat, if you know of a good example of leaves out vital context, I'm willing to take arguments. Uh, marginalization, marginalized. She never said the words um, that I know of. Did she talk about the concept in the abstract? Kind of. I don't know. I'll. You guys tell me if I should uh, flip on that one. Rape culture never came up. Equity. I mean, she talked about racial justice, and equity is a synonym, more or less, for justice. Do I want to stretch it that far? Does it matter for the sake of this bingo card? Not really. I'll leave it blank for now. Cultural appropriation, no. Gratuitous pausing for effect, not that I noticed. Uh, stupid clown, thank you. This was a great one. Glad I made it. Thanks, scribe. Uh, well, thank you for the your generosity, stupid clown. Um, I, I hope it's great only insofar as it points out just how nutso and subversively insidious some of this stuff is, and especially how it's part and parcel with some people in education these days. 
just, ah. Oh. Okay, anyway, guys, I'm going to chat now. If you guys have uh, arguments for one or the other uh, on the squares, let me know, and then we'll wrap up, and I'll show the final bingo card. I'm already over time from what I usually aim for, but, hey, it's one of those days. Uh, let's see. Uh, Richo8181, so it was good that I missed most of this, correct? LOL. Uh, if you don't want to have your head explode, maybe. Uh, Zach Osborne says word salad. I already circled word salad, so we're good on that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Zach Osborne, vital context, uh, three fifths clause. Okay. Does the actual language of the law just say indentured servants slash slaves? Does it not specifically say black people? I, I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. So if it doesn't, then maybe he leaves out vital context. It won't get us a bingo, but you know, as a completionist kind of thing. Uh, let's see. Uh, Luke Skywalker too, what defines gratuitous in terms of pausing? Like uh, a pausing where they are pausing for dramatic effect. They're like holding back their words, stifling a sob or something. You know, something that's very, you know, blatantly dramatic. That kind of thing. I didn't notice any of that here. Um, nothing came out to me. Uh, let's see. Keeverdam, Scribelite, you know this talk is from three years ago, right? I don't care. I, I mean, not I mean what I mean is nothing she is saying here fundamentally is all that different from the medium articles we read on Lords of the Night, night after night. Thank you, Frosted Glass. These aren't new ideas. These aren't old ideas. These aren't outdated. Three years ago, ten minutes ago. Same stuff, same mentality. I mean, I've done videos in the last three years that have promoted this exact same stuff. So yeah, maybe it's a little old, but it's not any less relevant as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Jaeger Pony, thank you so much. Scribe is really a scanner. He uses TEDx talks to explode people's heads from afar. <laughs> oh man, if only I was as cool as Michael Ironside, if only. Uh, some emulation, I'd call it a great one based on you bringing this insanity into the sunlight. Like I say, uh, if you hadn't told me, and I didn't even think I paid attention, if you hadn't told me this is three years old, I could have imagined this being done nine months ago. Seriously. I mean, does this strike untrue to things we're hearing about all the time these days as compared to videos I've done in the last three years myself? Yeah. Uh, Assassin the Gray, Scribe, like, do you suspect the daughter may have already picked up on the fact her mother utterly despises her? You know, kids kids at that age are very sensitive to, uh, you know, the emotions being projected by their parents, the subtle hints, the offset phrases and such. Who knows? I mean, like I say, I don't know who this lady is. Maybe she's changed her tune since then. Maybe her kids are perfectly fine. But taken by itself, I I, I, I worry for children who have parents who inherently think, that their children are flawed because of what they are and not for any other reason. Uh, Keeverdam, scribe like, no, I mean, I think about how screwed up her kids must be and how many other kids she has indoctrinated between then and today. Well, that is also true. I mean, again, if, again, if she hasn't changed her tune since then, three years have gone by, her child is, I, I don't know, she said, last time she said she was five years old, she's eight or 10 or whatever she is now. And how many students has she gone through and whatever educational role she plays? Yeah. No, it's it's a scary thought. I agree. Uh, Renovatio, Scribelite, if you think this is bad, remember these people, intersectional feminists, SJWs, and LGBT as one group are now determining child protection laws and influencing legal decisions uh, making across the West. Well, this is, uh, this is partially why I, I look for... Th this is why TEDx is such a, I think, valuable resource is because all of these events are community-based. They are small towns, uh, individual cities, that kind of stuff. And you have people coming from not the most prestigious places necessarily, but from the everyday, the everyday parts of our lives, business, education, uh, politics, and so on, uh, speaking, quote unquote, their truth. Uh, they're not headline names necessarily. They're not marquee individuals necessarily. They're not TED talk material necessarily, but they are 
speaking from the heart, from the areas of the world that ultimately will affect us the most, from the outside in. And, you know, if there's a value to this, if, if nothing else, is to bring these things to light and really examine uh, what people in uh, positions of influence uh, have to say about things. And that's, I mean, if there's any benefit to this, or at least education in this, or awareness to be had, it's that. Uh, a couple more comments, so the bingo card, and we'll move on and wrap up. Uh, Sar Jim, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude, except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States or any place, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, that was the... Uh, that was our changing the law. And then, of course, the punishment for crime is a lot of the argument today for uh, again, uh, arguing against our uh, criminal justice system, that prisons are thereby legally allowed to enslave the prisoners therein. And you see things like, you know, hard labor breaking rocks and so on. Um, now, that, that's, a, that's a, tub, a topic I've only partially looked at because it's been brought up only in a couple of TEDx talks and things before. I'd be curious to see something more expansive on that argument because I don't know if that's actually a practice per se or if that just allows some legal leeway for how much you get to pay uh, prisoners for their labor. Because I could see that as being an argument and maybe not one that I'd agree with necessarily, depending, but I'd have to, I'd have to hear something more expansive on it. I'll, I'll see if I can find something like that. Uh, let's see. I don't see... Sorry, Jim, 13th Amendment of the Constitution. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't want to sound like an idiot by saying the wrong amendment because, you know. Uh, let's see. Zach Osborne, three-fifths clause. Three-fifths clause, did it apply to black people or did it apply to just slaves or whatever else? I mean, even if I circle leaves out vital context, it doesn't get us a bingo. Uh, she would have had to have said something about microaggressions or uh, coined a new phrase. So either way, I don't think we're getting bingo this time, guys. But we filled up a lot of circles, or a lot of squares, I should say. Uh, oh, Zach says he posted the clause. I apologize. Let me scroll up. I must have missed it. Um, okay, adding to the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years and excluding Indians not taxed, three-fifths of all of their person. Okay. All right. I'll, I'll give that to you that she mis mischaracterized at least, you know, in spirit, that that law. All right, so that is uh, that is going to be it for the bingo card, guys. I didn't see anything else that argued elsewise for any other squares. Let me uh, bring that up. If you have anything else you'd like to say uh, to wrap this up, guys, put it in the chat now. I'm going to uh, display my bingo card for reference, and then uh, we will call this one closed as as. Obviously, at least for me, infuriating and as bewildering as it was. I don't know. There's just something about someone standing on a stage, professing the virtues of assessing people on the basis of their skin color, and then telling us that they hope for a world where race doesn't matter. And yet they're they're a teacher of children. Something very upsetting about that to me. I don't know what to tell you. But there you go, guys. There's my completed bingo card. We missed a bingo by just a square or two. Uh, next time I may use a different arrangement bingo card. So always remember to check the link in the description for the bingo card associated with the show at hand. Because uh, you never know. Um, yeah. I'll look at the chat one more time if you guys have anything else to say. Uh, that one servant of <laughs> that one servant of the Satania scribe light. I heard someone in the chat say racial justice and positive racial identity could be new buzzwords, buzz phrases, if you want to take that into consideration. Um, racial justice is not a new phrase. Positive racial identity. Huh. Oh, John Miller says, I'm scribe. The light gave me a different bingo card. Did it? Or the link? Did it? Oh. If it did, I apologize. I thought I'd uh, revise that. Okay. Oh, yeah, the link in the description is all. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. 
I apologize. Oh, I must have used an old... I have uh, just sort of a boilerplate description text I put in there. I must have not revised that one. Huh. Okay, well, I will update it in the future. I apologize, guys. I didn't mean to uh, confuse you. Not at all. Uh, but that's the one I used. I'll try to update that soon. Uh, if I uh, screwed up your guys' own game or tracking, then uh, there you go. Uh, Zach Osborne says, I'll at you on Twitter with the old bingo card I have. Scribe. Yeah, sorry, guys. That was a completely mistake on my part. Uh, buzzword, buzz phrase. You know what? Given how kooky a, uh, a version of uh, reality that she gave that particular uh, phrase, you know what? I will agree. Guys, we reached a bingo. I, I think if any TEDx talk for all of its insanity deserves to have a bingo, that's, that's probably the one. So, um, yeah, I don't know. That's just, uh, threw me for a loop guys really threw me for a loop. Um, let's see, there we go. That should be updated. Now we hit a bingo. I'll agree. And I'll try to correct that link in the description. I think I forgot to change it back after the Rachel Cargill thing. So I'll, I'll see if I can fix that. So anyway, enough about that. Guys, I do have to wrap this up. <sighs> thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining me on this one. This was a tough one, as you probably heard. This was a tough one. Um, worrisome, infuriating, bewildering all at once. And yet, this is the mentality that's out there. So keep your ears open. Be aware. Uh, but regardless, everyone, I hope you're having a great day. Uh, please stay safe and well. If you're not well, please get well soon. If you'd like to hear more from me or Ranting Monkey or Satsu Two Cents, you can find us live tonight on Ranting Monkey's channel at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern for Lords of the Night. Uh, we'll talk about the news. Uh, stories that you submit, uh, the everyday uh, insanity of the internet, and then take your questions. But with that, guys, I'm going to go off and uh, consider having a second pepper jack. <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for your attendance, your participation, and thank you, thank you so much for your generosity. I really do appreciate it. Hope you all have a good day, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.